go ahead and Mary. Thank you, Sue, and thank you to the um, Peace and Justice Work Group for allowing us to have airtime tonight. Uh, I'm Mary Vane, the convener of the Middle East uh, Task Force for Westminster, and I'd like to welcome the Ocean View members as well as Westminster members. Um, it's so nice to have continuing collaborative efforts, both upstate and downstate. So um, we thank you all for being here. Uh, and I see Elle Marie's just come on, so I'm very happy to see her as well. Uh, just to set the stage for tonight's program, let me say that at any one time, there are between 50 and 75 countries and territories across the globe that are engaged in armed conflict. It could be war with a neighboring country like Ukraine and Russia, it could be proxy wars where many nations are involved as has been the case in Syria. It could be territorial conflicts, genocide, ethnic cleansing, religious or civil wars, or some combination of those. Currently there's 70 million people who've been displaced from their homes by conflict somewhere in the world. Sadly, the people that tend to be most affected uh, by conflict are generally those that have the least input on the events or the direction of those events. They are the innocent victims. Often the leaders who are making the decisions are the most insulated from the suffering and their, life, their lifestyles might be the least affected by their choices. When it comes to refugees, most will not return to their homelands. Today, we're going to talk about Syria, a country that's endured more than 10 years of conflict. And our first speaker is Elle Marie Parker. You can see her. Uh, yeah, say hello to Elle Marie. Elle Marie is not a stranger to most of you. Uh, she serves as the regional liaison to Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon for the Presbyterian Church USA. Her work involves deepening and strengthening the ties between the Church of the Middle East and uh, the US Church. She facilitates American support for partner programs and activities in the region. And just to give you an example of how that works, um, when Westminster, when COVID started and Westminster wanted to provide some COVID aid uh, to Syria, but didn't know how to do it, the per person that we reached out to was Elle Marie. And she connected us with FAMIC, which is uh, actually the um, Fellowship of Middle East Evangelical Churches. Um, and that organization um, had a lot of programs um, and distribution systems and connections in country. And we were able to put together a very robust program that was quite successful. And that led to more and more programs thereafter. So that's an example of um, how we work together. Uh, as a mission coworker, she's headquartered in Beirut and she is our eyes and ears on the ground helping us to understand the evolving dynamics in the region and guiding our efforts so that they are meaningful and effective and healthy relationships with Syrian and Lebanese partners. Prior to this call, El Marie and her husband, Scott, served as parish pastors. Scott works with the Middle East Council of Churches and has lately had a focus on helping children deal with trauma. And we're fortunate tonight that uh, uh, El Marie and Scott are itinerating in the United States and that we will have the benefit of continuous electricity, which is not always the case in Lebanon. So I, and we're also happy that she's only three time zones away instead of seven and is um, coming to us from Oregon right now. So um, with that, let me turn it over to our dear friend, Elle Marie. 
Well, good evening to all of you. It's a gift to be with you. And thank you to Mary and the Peace and Justice team for the invitation to, to join you all. Um, as Mary said, we're not strangers to one another. So I'm, I'm glad to meet with you in this way and look forward, uh, inshallah, as we say, in the Middle East to the next time we can meet in person. I'm going to share my screen so that I can um, share with you a PowerPoint while I'm talking. Uh, today's gathering, as Mary said, the focus will be on Syria. And next week, we'll talk a little bit more about Lebanon and what's been going on there and the impact that then has on Syria. So um, it'll be a two-step conversation. I'm taking uh, my title for today's uh, conversation from the publication that was put out by the Syria-Lebanon Partnership Network a couple years ago called The Burden of Memory and the Hope of, of the Gospel. And for those of you who uh, have not yet had the opportunity to benefit from that publication, I would highly recommend it uh, to you. It fills out in more detail some of what I'm going to cover today, uh, especially in regards to history and some of the religious dynamics in Syria and how those things combined um, contribute to what's happening there and in the wider re region today. I'm sure as many of you are aware, Syria is uh, mentioned in scripture in numerous places, both in the Old Testament and New Testament. Um, and we encounter uh, characters of the biblical text uh, in both the Old and New Testament who are from Syria or had uh, life-changing realities uh, in the context of Syria. And certainly, Saul's journey to Damascus to do harm to the early uh, gatherings of, of followers of Jesus is one such story, and it was on the road to Damascus that Saul encountered uh, and was encountered by Jesus and um, comes out of that encounter with a new name and a new life purpose of Paul. Uh, when we have visited in Damascus, we've been privileged to walk the street called Straight and uh, visit a home that is attributed to Ananias, um, who helped Paul, discipled him in those early days. Uh, and this cafe, you can see the sign says Cafe of uh, St. Paul, and it's on the street uh, called Straight. So a little bit of uh, the local ethos there for you. It was also in Antioch uh, that the Christians were for the followers of Jesus were first called Christians. And uh, though Antioch, the ruins of Antioch uh, in today's geographic boundaries is actually located in eastern Turkey. Uh, at that time, it was part of greater Syria. Uh, and really, when you look at the uh, church relationships and entities and families that are part of the Middle East today, so many of them trace their roots back to those ancient times. Uh, and so we've had the privilege of meeting and worshiping with um, these different communities that I have listed out here, the Syriac Orthodox and Syriac Catholic families. The Syriac Orthodox are, of course, the oldest um, between the two of those. The Syriac Catholic communities emerged during the uh, Reformation work of the Catholic Church the, in the counter-Reformation movement to the Protestant Reformation movement. So that happened in the 1700s. The Maronite Catholics, though they are best known for being in Lebanon, their roots are actually in Syria, uh, coming out of the rural communities of Syria, uh, also in those early years. And then, of course, there are the Greek Orthodox uh, and Greek Catholic coming out of um, the Byzantine uh, era of the, the church, and um, their roots go deep in these communities as well. 
And then each of those communities have their evangelical or Protestant um, partner. And that would be the Syriac Evangelical Church, the Armenian Evangelical Church, and the Arabic speaking evangelicals of which nestle the Synod of the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon uh, is part of that community. And so just speaking of the Protestant development uh, of a presence in the Middle East, that of course goes back to early work of missionaries from both the United States and different places in Europe. Um, the earliest such work from the United States uh, was done by missionaries starting in the year 1823 in Lebanon, which at that time was part of greater Syria under the Ottoman Empire. And uh, I see that uh, Rod Stoddard is on the call and he's written a, a marvelous book about Sarah Smith, one of those early uh, pioneers of mission work in this area and the significant contribution that she and other uh, women especially have made to uh, educational institutions that continue to this day in Lebanon, uh, two of those being Lebanese American University and the uh, school, evangelical school for boys and girls overseen by the Synod of Syria and Lebanon now located in Arabia. Uh, for many years, it was in Beirut proper. Uh, out of that mission work, many different congregations were planted in both uh, what is today Syria and Lebanon. Along with that, the commitment of those early missionaries were to start a school and hospital in each town or village. And they, they had kind of turned this a little bit into, um, out of the American competitive spirit, uh, into a competition by saying, uh, we'll start two uh, hospitals and um, schools in each town. And people would ask them, well, why two? And their response was, well, if we start one, we know that the, the Catholics or the Orthodox will start another. And uh, that is, in fact, what has happened in many of the communities across the region. By the 1950s, uh, the way in which uh, the forebears of today's Peace USA were understanding mission was beginning to shift into an understanding that has continued to develop since then that we really work in partnership and collaboration with our local partners on the ground, uh, rather than being the ones who are in the driver's seat. And so in that spirit uh, began the development of what we know today as the Synod of Syria and Lebanon. So in 1959, that Synod took place um, in terms of its formation. And the congregations that had all been started as individual congregations, they had a, a decision to make at that point of whether they wanted to adopt a Presbyterian uh, polity and come together as a synod or whether they wanted to retain a congregational polity. And so there are a number of congregations who chose to walk the congregational polity route and um, they have a network among them that they stay in relationship with. And they, of course, are well known to our synod partners. And there is a lot of camaraderie and uh, fellowship that, that continues to this day between all of those churches. Uh, but there were the majority of the congregations who chose uh, the Presbyterian polity uh, route and so became known as the Synod of Syria and Lebanon. And since that time, uh, it has been leadership of the Synod that has overseen the educational work um, that not only uh, grew up in those early mission years, but has continued to grow and expand. And so at this time, the Synod oversees seven different schools in Lebanon and one in Syria and four of the congregations in Syria oversee their own schools. And these are all um, exceptional educational uh, institutions that work with students from uh, nursery or kindergarten uh, age through high school. So that's just a, a touch point on uh, what is a rich and diverse uh, biblical and religious history of Syria. 
there's another lens that we can bring uh, to the region and this obviously overlaps with and interacts with religious history. And this also is just a very abbreviated uh, look at history that picks up uh, just after World War I. There's obviously a, a ton of history that predates that. Let me move this little box over here. Um, so starting with the end of World War I and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, uh, what ended up getting established were different mandates seen overseen either by France or Great Britain. And Syria and uh, what would become Lebanon were part of the French mandate. The British mandate included Iraq, uh, Palestine, uh, uh, Jordan, um, and uh, I'm missing one country right now. It'll come back to me in a moment. Uh, so, that was in essence colonial rule. And I, I think it's important um, in order to understand the dynamics of these countries today to recognize uh, the distinctions between what happened under Ottoman rule and what happened under um, Western colonial rule. Uh, the Ottomans I think were pretty brilliant in terms of how they uh, worked with their very diverse empire, uh, where they gave a lot of room for local uh, leadership control and really honored the distinct traditions of uh, the various peoples that made up their, their rather large empire at, at one point in time. Uh, where they exercised control really came um, more through the issues of economics in the, the empire. So I love this quote that you can find in the Syria-Lebanon Partnership Network uh, document. They say, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed after their defeat in World War I, they left a rich, tolerant, and diverse social tradition in Syria, uh, which had been a center for Arab history and culture. Now, that's not to say that there weren't atrocities that happened under the Ottoman Empire, particularly in its last years. And of course, the terrible genocides from the late 1800s through 1915 uh, are evidence of that. And uh, even earlier today, during our Lenten reflection call, uh, Pauline Sagarian from the Genetian Memorial Program joined us and shared some of that uh, reality from an Armenian perspective. Uh, but this is also true, this quote that I've just read. And, and so I think um, in this, we're stepping into the dynamics of this region where you have uh, both these tremendous uh, positives and strengths, and you also have these deep wounds, and both things are true at the same time. The Sykes-Picot Treaty in 1916 uh, really set into concrete these mandates. And again, here you begin to see some of the geopolitical tensions and dynamics that have continued into the present day, where the West has one conversation amongst itself, and the conversation that they have with people in the Middle East is of a different nature and tenor, and they don't line up with each other. And so it cultivates this deep level of um, fear and uh, dishonesty, and uh, there's a lack of transparency, and so a lack of, of trust. And again, uh, from the Syria-Lebanon Partnership Network document, um, this treaty was affirming that at the conclusion of the war, the region now known as Syria and Lebanon would be under French control, while the British would administer what is now Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and Iraq. The issue was that that was done in secret between France and Great Britain, um, and it followed conversation the conversations that the British government had in secret with Arab leaders, uh, promising that their areas would have independent rule after the Ottoman defeat. And it was in this way that the British um, called forward Arab peoples to fight on behalf of uh, Great Britain and the allies uh, at that time to defeat um, 
those on the other side, uh, Germany and the Ottoman Empire uh, being among the primary uh, opposition. And so that's where you begin to see this disconnect in terms of how people on the ground in the Middle East understand their history and uh, the promises that they felt they had received and then the betrayal of those promises because of what was done in secret between Western powers. And that legacy of distrust continues to influence what goes on in the region today. Nonetheless, uh, life has continued and the countries uh, that make up what we know as the Middle East or Western Asia uh, have continued to try and find uh, their own identities. Syria uh, had that day of independence on April 17th, 1946. This is when the last of the French uh, troops left the country. It's known locally as evacuation day for that reason. Uh, and it was uh, British troops that helped push the French out of Syria at that time. So again, all these interesting dynamics where some who used to work together now work against each other and, and so on and so on. But following that independence, um, Syria faced very challenging years of trying to develop as a modern nation state with this long 400 plus year history of Ottoman rule and then a much shorter time of Western colonial rule uh, all with very different mindsets and different assumptions and different values of what it means to uh, operate in, in the world in the early 1900s to mid 1900s. Um, this is during the time then that many different parties are competing for power and influence in this new country of Syria. Uh, the Ba'ath Party was one of those. And those that made up the leadership of the Ba'ath Party had been educated in the West, in France in particular. And so they were trying to develop um, a socialist ideology for Syria that would allow Syria to really um, develop its own identity and that would protect the diversity that existed across the country. Uh, the desire has been that there would be a real inclusiveness in Syria. And there's many ways where that has been true. Um, in the last 11 years, under the fighting that has been going on since 2011, all of that has been put at risk. Um, but the Ba'ath Party did come into power. Uh, 1970 is when Hafez al-Assad, uh, he, took control of the country under the Ba'ath Party through a coup. And so his family and the Ba'ath Party have been in control of Syria since then with Bashir al-Assad coming into power in the year 2000 following his father's death. Ba'athism as a political ideology really emphasizes Arab nationalism. So that sense of pride in being Arab uh, that has caused problems with some of the other ethnic uh, and linguistic identities in Syria and in the wider region. Uh, and it's part of why it never quite held together. Uh, but another value that's emphasized by Baathism is secularism uh, and then authoritarianism, which of course we see in the current uh, governance of Syria. And then in March 2011, we see the start of the proxy uh, civil war in Syria. And I say proxy civil war because um, this is a reality on the ground in Syria where it was not just Syrians fighting Syrians. There is that dimension to what has happened in Syria. But there was also this reality that many other um, countries had an agenda for Syria and had fighters ready to go into Syria. And so at one point there were over a thousand different militias operating on the ground in Syria from countries around the globe. 
Uh, and so that's that proxy element um, and is part of what makes the dynamics in Syria very complex to figure out. It's not as simplistic as often gets communicated in our media that uh, if only um, it were possible to get rid of uh, President Assad, all would be well in Syria. Uh, there's many more layers of complexity uh, that make that change in the power structure uh, complicated and uh, fraught with other um, even worse dilemmas than what is currently happening in Syria. So I'm going to shift gears just a little bit now to um, talk about where the Presbyterian churches are located in Syria. Uh, how the background that I've just given you, what some of the practical implications of that is on the ground and the work that our partners are doing. So uh, this again is just a thumbnail sketch of uh, so much more that is part of the dynamic in Syria. So I hope it, it gives you at least a starting point. This map, you'll see uh, these different circles on the map, and these are the general locations of the 15 remaining active Presbyterian churches in Syria. There were more Presbyterian churches uh, prior to the start of all of the fighting in 2011, but a number of them are in locations that are still under control of Islamic opposition forces to the Syrian government. And so the Synod has not been able to um, enter that area and reclaim those churches. And there are some uh, churches that were just so uh, heavily uh, impacted by the fighting that they have not yet been able to uh, reformulate and uh, come back together as a worshiping community. So right now there are three Presbyterian churches. I'm gonna start up in the Northeast corner there where Turkey and Iraq uh, come around Syria. This is the Al Jazeera area of Syria. There are three Presbyterian churches there in uh, Malkia in the far Northeast tip, uh, Kamishli and then Al Hasaki. Uh, this is the part of the country where the US government uh, continues to have a presence working with a coalition force of Kurds and Arabs. Um, it's quite a complex area with uh, Russian troops involved, Turkish troops involved, American troops, and that coalition of, of Kurds and uh, Arabs. So there's a lot of dynamics going on there. Uh, it remains uh, fairly isolated from the rest of the country, uh, which has all other kinds of implications to it. Then as we come across to the West, uh, we see Aleppo and there remains a Presbyterian church in Aleppo. Uh, the churches in Kamishli and al Hasaki, uh, they each have a school that they oversee. The same for the church in Aleppo, uh, the Synod school, that uh, is the school that's overseen by the Synod there, that is also located in Aleppo. And then the church in Aleppo in the last couple of years has started a medical clinic, uh, which has also been doing some tremendous work there. Then as you come into this next area, um, this is Idlib province. This is the part of the country that uh, still remains outside of Syrian government control. Uh, into this province has poured the remaining um, 3 million uh, Islamist and opposition fighters and their families. Uh, it's also a very complex area that is overseen by Turkey and Russia, which you can imagine given everything else that Russia is involved with right now with Ukraine, uh, makes all of these dynamics that much more uh, complicated and fraught with tension. A couple of the Presbyterian churches are in this province, and those are the ones that the Synod has not had access to. Um, as the Islamist and um, opposition fighters 
began to take over this part of Syria, uh, all of the Christians were pushed out off of their land, uh, out of their homes, uh, out of their businesses. Coming down the coastline, uh, there are a couple of other uh, Presbyterian churches in Latakia or Latakia, depending on how one wants to pronounce that. Uh, this is also in the area where the Russians have their warm uh, water port. Um, there's another Presbyterian church in Banias. And then coming uh, inland again, there's a Presbyterian church in uh, Yazdia, just over the northern border of Lebanon. Uh, coming into the center of the country, Presbyterian churches in Homs and uh, Feiruzi, which is a kind of a suburb community of, of Homs, and then two churches up in the, the Hama area. Uh, and then you come down. Uh, onto the eastern side of Lebanon, into uh, the southern part of Syria. And there are several more congregations in this corridor leading to Damascus, along with a congregation in Damascus. And then a couple of congregations further south, and these also um, have had a difficult time kind of coming back together again because of the complexities of the dynamics with uh, Israel along the border there. So just to give you kind of a geographical idea, you can see that our Presbyterian partners are throughout the country. Uh, the Fellowship for Middle East Evangelical Churches with whom you all have partnered uh, work not only with these Protestant churches, but with other Protestant churches from the Armenian Union, uh, from the, the Syriac evangelical tradition, and from others. Uh, they also collaborate uh, with Orthodox churches in the areas. Uh, so they are working throughout Syria, um, uh, along with several of our other partners. I've had the opportunity to talk uh, recently with Reverend Salam Hanna. You see him here in the picture behind the pulpit. He is pastor of the National Evangelical Church in Latakia, in Latakia. Uh, this congregation is the largest of the, the churches in Syria with around a thousand members. And um, uh, he also oversees the synod's relief work in Syria. So he is quite busy as a solo pastor of a thousand member church um, and uh, a good friend of ours. And then uh, I had mentioned um, Hasaki area and I wanted to introduce you to the young woman who is serving as the pastor there. This is preacher Mathilde Sabach. Uh, she's been a delight to know uh, a graduate from Neary School of Theology uh, several years ago. Uh, married now with twin daughters. And uh, I, I wanted to mention her in particular because uh, many of you uh, were probably aware of the uh, prison break that happened in Hasaki province by ISIS prisoners and their attack on the city of Hasaki. Um, Mathilde and her family were among many who were hiding in basements for days on end as that uh, fighting rocked the city. Um, and yet she and her congregation uh, persevere with their ministries in the midst of those challenges. So the situation in Syria today, uh, I've now had the opportunity to talk with a number of our different partners. Uh, and these are the consistent things that I'm hearing from among them. Uh, the internal fighting has pretty much finished in the majority of the country. And so there's a level of stability in the country. Uh, the Syrian government has regained control over uh, a good part of the country, although not the far Northeast that I mentioned uh, is under US and um, coalition of Kurds and Arabs control with Turkey having a heavy hand there as well. And the Northwest in the Idlib area. Uh, I mentioned the prisoner insurgency in Hasaki. Uh, part of the issues that are going on in Northeast Syria comes down to oil and wheat. Um, you might recall that under President Trump, 
uh, that he made a big deal over capturing the oil fields in uh, Northeast Syria uh, and made it sound as if the US had a right to those oil fields, which of course the US does not because the US is not in Syria under the invitation of the Syrian government. Um, the, that same coalition of forces also oversees now the wheat fields. Uh, that part of Syria is the uh, predominant place where wheat is grown in the country of Syria. Uh, prior to the war breaking out in um, Syria, Syria provided all of its own food for its people plus exported food. And now, uh, people are going hungry in Syria because these fields, um, there's a lot of back and forth, but the Kurds in essence don't want to sell the wheat to the Syrian government. Um, and so this is, is causing uh, some massive problems for providing for wheat and flour uh, in Syria. Uh, oil as well. Um, is not going to the Syrian government. And so it creates issues like no heating fuel uh, during very cold winters. Uh, so these are some of the tensions that are continuing. Um, I mentioned the issues in Northwest Syria already. Uh, another of the realities on the ground today is Syri in Syria are the ongoing bombings by the Israeli Air Force. And that's happened as recently as a couple of weeks ago in Damascus and several months ago in Latakia. Uh, Scott and I, maybe two weeks before we left to come to the US, we were sitting in our apartment getting ready and we heard this uh, loud sound coming over our apartment building. And it was Israeli, uh, um, Air Force invading Lebanese uh, airspace to fire missiles into Syria. And this happens on a, on a regular basis and is very unnerving to people living in Lebanon. And of course, uh, people lose their lives in these bombings in, uh, in Syria. And, and it's uh, rationalized by Israel as um, fighting Iran uh, on Syrian uh, ground. So again, that proxy war dynamic is at play in Syria. There's also uh, ongoing impacts, negative impacts from the U.S. government-led sanctions in uh, Syria. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, there's already felt impacts from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, the Syrian pound has devalued further. That happened instantly. Uh, and escalating prices, especially on cooking oil and wheat. Uh, both Syria and Lebanon depend on wheat imports from Ukraine uh, now that, that Syria cannot benefit from its own uh, wheat fields. And uh, all of those shipments have been disrupted. Uh, so I've heard from our partners in both Syria and, and Lebanon, uh, their deep, deep concern over this and what it means uh, for everyday people on the ground. Um, another dynamic that's at work in Syria and has been the case since the late 1990s is an extended season of drought. Uh, and this is part of what fed into the start of the uh, proxy civil war in Syria. There's a lot more I can say about that if, if you're interested, but I think it's an important element to keep in mind that um, Climate change issues uh, contribute to military actions and uh, contribute to the displacement of millions of people. And we're just on the front edge of that reality as a globe. Um, there, there's much more to come in terms of displaced people due to um, climate change types of events. And then of course, COVID-19 has been a reality in Syria as it has the rest of the globe. Uh, it's just been among the least of concerns for Syrians in the midst of everything else that I've talked about. Uh, vaccinations have been available through the World Health Organization uh, and those are available free of charge, uh, but testing um, 
like we do here in the US, uh, Syrians have to pay for testing. So the, the numbers uh, in regards to COVID-19 are uh, really not uh, very difficult to have any sense of accuracy about um, how COVID-19 has impacted people. Uh, but our partner congregations have certainly had uh, congregation members who have died from COVID in these last couple of years. So these are some of the practical implications of, of what I just laid out here. Um, these, these are uh, statistics that come from the UN. Uh, 80 to 85% of the Syrian population is in need of direct assistance with food, let alone everything else. Um, 12.8 million Syrians are food insecure. Economic recovery is not going to be possible until sanctions are lifted. That's just uh, a bottom line fact. And uh, now we're, we uh, will have yet another country destabilized by sanctions in terms of what's happening in Russia and the impact that that will have on everyday people there. Uh, uh, economic warfare is no less horrific than uh, physical military warfare. Um, it's just, it uh, kills people more slowly and it's less obvious to we who are citizens of the countries uh, implementing these, san these sanctions. Uh, it is a obviously upfront, less bloody tool that, that our politicians have available to them, but it's no less destructive to the people on the ground. Uh, what the sanctions have meant in uh, Syria is that fuel for electricity, heating, uh, cars, it's all rationed. 50 liters of diesel a year per family for heating um, and for running generators. Uh, that's not a whole lot. Uh, city grid power provided uh, you know, on the type of grids that we all take for granted when we turn on a light switch. Uh, that provides electricity for one hour, and then it's off for five hours, then on for one hour, uh, and so on. That's in Damascus. It's different um, in various places in the country. Uh, the government has stopped importing uh, a lot of items in order to try and keep the currency stable, but uh, the war in Ukraine has destabilized that um, again. Uh, that process of stopping the import of items has led to an escalation in prices for repair parts because they're just hard to find, if not impossible to find. Uh, and now there's a new layer of taxes on uh, cell phone usage in Syria, which is how everyone stays in touch with one another and the world. So that's a heavy burden on people. Uh, I think one of the things that's important for us to realize is that even though US government sanctions um, don't cover food and medicine, uh, because of the way in which our sanctions are uh, worded, it makes um, companies outside of Syria very leery of doing any kind of business with Syria. And so that means that food and medicines uh, have a hard time getting into the country. Uh, so that sense of isolation is, is there in a very holistic way, even though the sanctions do not cover uh, everything. Um, and then another piece that I've heard from our partners is uh, a lot of confusion over what the conditions for reconciliation with the global community actually are uh, in order to lift sanctions or limit sanctions. And uh, here you see, uh, is it detached from Russia? Is it detached from Iran? Is it reconciled with Israel? Is it Assad's rec resignation? Is it some combination of all of those? Um, so that's uh, some of what's out there that the Syrian people are trying to understand. Uh, and then another comment from a partner is, um, well, you can force Assad to resign, but that doesn't change the, the whole governance structure and the security state mechanisms that have been in place for a long time. So again, back to that, uh, this is a very complex situation and uh, 
how do Syrians have a say in their own future? Syrians who remain in the country, how do they have a say in their own future? They bring a very different uh, dynamic to the conversation than Syrians who have left the country. Uh, and so I think that's another piece that we need to stay mindful of is uh, those are two very different conversations. And it's not only two conversations, it's multiple conversations and perspectives. And then the work of our uh, PCUSA partners in the midst of this context. I'm gonna move this little box over here. So within the Synod of Syria and Lebanon, uh, the congregations are all continuing to meet for worship, uh, Sunday school and their other discipleship equipping activities. Uh, like our congregations in the US, they met online for a good part of the, the uh, first year or so of the COVID pandemic but they are all back in person at this point in time. Uh, I mentioned the four schools overseen by the local congregations uh, and the synod. Um, between those four schools, um, it's over 7,000 students that are uh, cared for and educated through those institutions. So it's, uh, these are very, um, important educational institutions. Uh, the, the Synod also continues its diaconal ministries to the wider community, and that is especially focused on food security, fuel and rent assistance, and school scholarships. In 2021, they distributed $125,000 from partners uh, amongst the churches in five even payments. Uh, in 2022, they intend to increase that to 175,000. Uh, and there's over a thousand families that benefit from that uh, over the, the course of the year. I mentioned the medical clinic in Aleppo. Uh, they're serving over 3,000 clients a month. They have internal medicine, pediatrics, gynecology, orthopedics, dermatology, dental, pharmacy, and some radiology. Um, services. And so they're, they're really working hard to bring those specialists in uh, and have regular appointments available for people. CPS is Compassion Protestant Society. This is the Synod's diaconal arm. And in Syria, uh, CPS's focus has been on children's interfaith work, uh, on the practical values that encourage a um, cohesive society. Uh, and so that's been their work in Syria. Uh, they worked specifically in Aleppo and Latakia on that program. Middle East C Council of Churches is also very active in Syria. Uh, their work includes education, uh, health, and livelihood by rehabilitating schools and health centers. Uh, they do a lot of making medication available to people. Um, this is done in collaboration with partners and they offer a lot of different kinds of vocational training to youth um, and vocational support to older adults that are trying to restart their businesses that uh, were either destroyed or their, uh, the content of their businesses uh, was destroyed. In the, in the fighting in their particular cities. And then they are also developing agricultural and livestock projects. Uh, Fellowship for Middle East Council of Churches, I know we'll hear more on uh, some of the specific work that you've uh, partnered with them on, uh, but they are part of church lay leadership development and uh, relief and development work in Syria. Forum for Development, Culture and Dialogue, uh, they have been working years in uh, Syria, and their focus is also on development and then peace building initiatives uh, with a special emphasis on young adults. And World Student Christian Federation, they work with Christian university students in Syria on leadership development and interfaith work. So that's an, just an outline of, of the breadth and depth of work that our various partners are doing in Syria today. And I just wanted to end with these two photos. This is one of my favorite pictures uh, from Yezdia, which is just north of Lebanon, looking back into Lebanon. So the mountains are the mountains of Lebanon. And in the foreground, you see some of the fertile 
uh, olive orchards of uh, Syria. This lake is on the Syrian side of the border as well. Just a beautiful, beautiful part of the country. And then this is a piece of public art uh, in the city of Homs. Um, many murals there as families began returning and they wanted to visualize the hopes that they have for their city for the future. And this is a profound one um, speaking to, to children uh, being the future and uh, life conquering the large pile of military equipment that has uh, destroyed many lives and uh, many cities in Syria over the years. So with our Syrian partners, we continue to lean into hope, uh, the hope of the ways in which our God remains active in and committed to the people of Syria for their long-term good. Uh, a future of hope for them. I'll stop sharing screen at this point. Thank you, Elle Marie. That was a beautiful image to end up. And don't we all pray that it is so. Um, let me turn it over to Michelle Butler, who is Westminster's um, convener for our global mission work. And she has been particularly very active in leading our programs in Syria. So she's just gonna review some of our activities. And I know our time is short. You may have to hold questions um, for our second, um, um, the second part of this uh, presentation, which will be focused on Lebanon next week. But um, let me turn it over to Michelle for right now. Thanks so much, Mary. And wow, thank you, Elmarie, for that really helpful just background and just stepping us through everything. That really, uh, really helps me a lot as I sort of stepped into uh, working with Syria not very long ago. So um, thank you very much for that. And also it, it um, I, I love the way you ended because it kind of feeds right into the way that Westminster and Ocean View churches have been uh, involved with Syria. So I will not take a lot of time, but I just want to go through some of the ways that we've been working with Syria. Um, let's see how we do this. Here we go. So our relationship with Syria began shortly after the civil war started over 10 years ago. And initially we collected boots for refugees that were fleeing to camps on the Syrian borders. Um, subsequent collections at Westminster and several other multi-faith partners consisted of clothes and coats, blankets, all kinds of medical equipment and supplies, as well as children's clothes and toys. Uh, transport to the refugee camps was coordinated through the Naranj Tree uh, Foundation, and they were put in these containers, like you can see in the picture here. Um, following the container shipments, we worked with the National Evangelical Senate of Syria and Lebanon, the NESL that uh, El Marie was speaking about, to aid members of in-country churches as well as those in refugee camps. And we did this by providing monies for food packages, fuel, the cost of which was rapidly rising and continues to do so, as we know. Um, and then also to help subsidize rent costs and to support schools with supplies and other necessities for the kids. Uh, when COVID hit in 2020, we worked with a new partner, which was the FMEEC, the Fellowship of Middle East Evangelical Churches, which is located in Lebanon. We raised $7,000 through our members at Westminster and Ocean View. And with the Syrian Lebanon Partnership Network, we applied for and got approved for an Ignite grant of $20,000 through Newcastle Presbytery. So now with some of these funds, we were able to distribute uh, 3,800 hygiene packages in six different regions within Syria. But then as, um, oops, let me see here. So as uh, our, the food sources became increasingly difficult, we transitioned to emergency food packages and can, that contained essentials such as rice, spaghetti, lentils, vegetable oil, sugar and salt, canned beef, tea, and tomato paste. And we were able to send food to 889 families, which also included 400 kids. 
Now, um, the Syrian Livelihood Revival Project kicked off in 2021, and this helps refugees and displaced farming families return to their properties and restart their businesses after 11 years of this war. Uh, we, Westminster partnered with Ocean View again, as well as with United Church of Christ and the Christian Church or Disciples of Christ, uh, and it was administered by the FMEEC. Uh, sheep, goats, and bees, along with feed and veterinary supplies and services and beekeeping supplies, were distributed to 25 families within a stable region of the southern part of Syria. Now, this year, we built on our success and enthusiasm for this project, and we approached Newcastle Presbyterian for an IGNITE grant last fall, and we were awarded with a $30,000 extension for the uh, SLRP. And with this, we also added another 2,000 from church members, and so we were able to not only provide sheep and goats and bees, but also chickens for 32 additional families. And I would just note that the benefactors of receiving these uh, different sheep and goats and things were all selected on greatest need. So it's not by religion or some other type of discriminatory factor. They're all a very good community collaboration project. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, I don't know if we have any time for questions. Um, maybe we better maybe i better end it and then if uh folks want to have questions we could do that after does that sound appropriate sue i don't want to yeah uh occasionally these uh programs run a little beyond the eight o'clock time frame um i certainly think uh entertaining a question or two at this point would be fine Okay. Um, and as Mary said, there's next week's session as well, and there may be opportunities to integrate questions from the two. So, uh, but I thought yeah, certainly. Let, yeah, let me just, I'll say uh, next week, El Marie will be with us uh, again at seven o'clock on Thursday, and she'll be discussing issues and the challenges in Lebanon and the interconnectedness of the events in Syria and Lebanon. So she'll be sharing stories and illustrating with photos as we've seen this week. And we thank you in advance, Elmarie, for joining us yet again. Mm. So um, yeah, so why don't we open up for a couple of questions and then uh, I would like our partner over at Ocean View, Bev Bailey, she's going to do our closing prayer. Um, so I guess I could stop sharing at this point so we can see each other again. That would be great. And if somebody has a question or a comment, if you go down to the reactions section at the bottom of your screen and just click on raise hand, you will go to the top left of the screen and uh, Michelle can call on you. Oh, and I see Bob's daughter's got his hand up. Um, Hello, Bob. This is kind of a, a three part question. Uh, would you comment on, uh, first of all, the, the number of uh, of uh, Christian, uh, of uh, Presbyterian Syrians or Syrian Presbyterians and their, their socioeconomic status. And then their, their particular, the particular relationship of the Christian in Syria to the Assad government. So I think I heard uh, two main questions there, but uh, if I miss something, let me know, uh, Rob. Um, it's hard to know right now the numbers uh, of, of Christians of any kind, uh, let alone evangelicals that are in Syria. The numbers are just too fluid because of people uh, moving around and um, internally displaced, some who have left the country. Uh, the Synod even doesn't, hasn't even been able to hold a general assembly uh, for several years now. So I, I can't give you a number on that. Uh, prior to the start of this war, Christians made up about 10% of Syria. Um, as to the socioeconomic level of um, Christians and Protestants in particular, uh, before the war, they were all um, middle income and higher uh, in the country. But at this point, um, Pretty much everyone's impoverished. 
uh, it, it's just been economically catastrophic in, in the country. Um, and with the devaluation of the Syrian pound, it's, uh, it's hard to live. So the pastors of the synod are paid um, not by their local congregations, but by the synod. So it's a little bit of a different model than what we have in the US. Uh, and because of that, the pastors have, uh, until the economic collapse in Lebanon, have at least been able to support their families. Uh, but the economic collapse in Lebanon uh, and the dominoes that that has set in motion has made even that difficult. And so now the Synod for the first time, um, really since the missionaries were in charge of work in, in Syria and Lebanon, for the first time, the Synod is asking partners for financial support to support their pastors. Uh, they've always been able to uh, cover those expenses and all of the ministry expenses of the churches. So it's a very serious point at this time. The relationship of um, Christians to the Assad government, I think, is also very complex as we've talked with them. Um, there are some that are um, complete fans of the, the current president, uh, recognizing that without uh, him remaining in power, uh, Syria would have collapsed into a chaos far beyond anything that we've seen during this war, uh, because there's no other person or party that would have been able to step into that power vacuum. And the most powerful forces in Syria, apart from the Syrian government, have been um, extremist groups who were basically calling for the end of everyone that thought differently than they do. Uh, and so for Christians, it has been a, an issue of existential threat uh, to see the current secular-based government um, end in Syria. And so for that reason, they are in support of the Syrian government. That does not mean that they are in agreement with how the Syrian government operates, but it's a recognition that um, to replace a secular government with a radicalized Islamist government is not one that would benefit uh, anyone but radicalized Islamists. Uh, thank you very much. That was a great question. And uh, Elmarie, we're so thankful to have you with us. And uh, uh, with every discussion, I realized how much more complex it is and how difficult it is to come up with solutions. Uh, but we're so appreciative of the work that you do on the ground uh, to offer hope and, um, uh, and just show the presence of God. Um, now may I ask Beverly to close us in prayer. When Mary asked me if I would pray, you know, I thought I'm a music person. So the first thing I thought of was the hymn called as partners in Christ's service. And, you know, here we are together as two churches, but we have so many other partners and El Marie, thank you so much for all the information you've given us tonight. I was in Syria in 2000 but only in the Damascus region. So um, you, you've brought back a lot of memories to me and uh, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna read a verse of, of the hymn because sometimes we don't actually know what the words are to hymns, we just sing them. Uh, and then I'll, I'll pray us out. Thank you. Called as partners in Christ's service, called the ministries of grace. We respond with deep commitment, fresh new lines of faith to trace. May we learn the art of sharing side by side and friend with friend, equal partners in our caring to fulfill God's chosen end.
Gracious God, thank you tonight for bringing us all together to hear of cataclysmic problems in Syria and how their people continue to strive and to live as well as they can. Thank you for all the people that have given them help in this uncertain world that we live in. It seems that the problems are never ending. So be with us as we think about all that we've heard tonight and find ways to be of assistance and side by side, friend to friend. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So thank you all for being here with us this evening, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. We know of some people who weren't able to be here today, but um, are looking forward to joining us next Thursday. The recording of tonight's program will be available on Westminster's YouTube channel beginning tomorrow, and the link to it will be in the next edition of the Weekly Word. So um, deep gratitude to Elmarie, and to Mary and Michelle and Bev for bringing up this, us this program. Uh, and we pray for the people of Syria and Lebanon and Ukraine and across the globe as we seek peace and justice through hope and action. Thank you all. Thank you so very much. Good to be with you all. Have a good rest of your evening. Good night. Okay.